Anthony has a lot of hobbies and activities, including running this conference. So um, this afternoon, he's going to speak to us about uh, civil engineering or engineering progress in the Quad Cities over the last 100 years. So thank you, Anthony. All right. Um, well, I uh, last year, before everything was crazy, at the, the it was supposed to be the 100th anniversary this year of the uh, Society of American Military Engineers, and we were going to do this great centennial track, and I was going to get people from all over the Quad Cities to come talk about all this great stuff that's been done over the past century, and obviously nothing in this last year has probably worked out the way any of us thought it was going to, and so um, I really like uh, history just personally. Um, I used to be president of the historic district in downtown Rock Island, and um, we helped restore an old house there and stuff. So I really just, uh, I had a lot of fun doing some research here and trying to come up with some things that I thought were some pretty, pretty key, uh, pretty key events here in the past hundred years, of the quad city. So you can agree or disagree with me at the end of this about what you think about the things I found out here or whatever. But, uh, uh, this is, this is my kind of, uh, highlights of what I think's happened over the past century. And, and I will talk about a couple other things, um, as well. So um, you can see a bunch of them on the on the screen there. Maybe it'll let me go to the next slide. There we go. All right. So um, obviously, I think the thing that probably everybody hears about, talks about when they think about you know historic engineering in the Quad Cities um, is the stuff you can see over here on the right side. The first railroad bridge crossing the Mississippi River back in 1856. So. Uh, obviously, that was a pretty major event. Um, you know, people from all over the world talked about it. It was the first time anybody ever crossed the river before. Um, as I was looking through all this stuff and reading about engineering wonders and marvels and feats and achievements, uh, the other, the next one that kind of popped out here chronologically that surprised me was the wing dams. And I guess I hadn't really thought about how big of a deal they are. We're actually working on a project to upgrade some wing dams in my department right now, and. I don't know. I just didn't think twice about how big of a deal they were. But but at the time, like the river was such a huge part of the commerce and, and the economic engine of our nation. Changing how the river worked um, in this fairly simple and cost effective way was was a major thing at the time. So there was a I'll show you here an article a little bit here about how that was considered an engineering uh, achievement at the time. Um, Quad Cities also at one point had quite a few automobile manufacturers. Obviously, that's not the case now. Um, but the Duncan Steam Wagon was one of the first one of those that came out in 1892. Uh, the first roadway to cross the state of Iowa um, in 1909, the River to River Road. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that today was kind of a thing. Um, the first radio transmission west of the Mississippi and the second radio station ever uh, was located here in Davenport. Uh, opened up in 1922, WOC. The Lock and Dam 15 project in 1933, still the biggest roller dam in the world and obviously a pretty major achievement. Again, kind of going back to that river stuff that I talked about with the wing dams. The very first four-lane paved road in Davenport popped up in 1935, which, which to me, again, as I was looking through all this stuff, it just seems wild to me that less than 100 years ago, we got our very first four-lane road. When I can hop on four-lane roads pretty much every which way across the Quad Cities and in, and in the greater United States now. So uh, that that one was kind of a surprise. And then the very first paved transcontinental highway on just the north side of the Quad Cities, the Lincoln Highway also opened up in 1935. The very first four-lane bridge to ever cross the Mississippi River in 1940 was here in the Quad Cities. Interstate highways started popping up around 1956, although really in earnest in the 1960s here in our region. Um, and then uh, a cool, th again, something I never heard of, uh, an experimental idea of putting a yellow triangle up on a post and calling it a no passing sign uh, was invented on the Lincoln Highway just north of town here in 1958. So, so what makes a great engineering achievement? So ASCE, they've got seven uh, civil engineering wonders of the world here, the Golden Gate, the Panama Canal, which has got a, a lot of great quad city history from the Hennepin Canal research. Um, and, the, and the old Moline locks, the Ataipu Dam, Empire State Building, the Delta Works uh, in the Netherlands, the uh, CN Tower up in uh, Canada, and the Channel Tunnel. Um, when I was looking around, I also found up in the top right corner, uh, 
Ralph Majeski, who is a very famous guy here locally for all of his bridge work, um, he wrote his list of engineering feats back uh, before many of these were even built. Um, but you can see Panama Canal popped up on both. And then, of course, he, he recognized his Quebec bridge that he worked on also as a pretty big engineering achievement. And then I found this one in the bottom right corner from a planning document where they talk about the Empire State Building also being an engineering marvel. But who wants it? Nobody does because of the congestion on your streets, the effect on your sewer and water lines, the danger of panic. Oh, my gosh, we'd want to put out a fire on the, four, on the 90th floor. And I guess I just I never thought about the Empire State Building being a problem before, but apparently not everybody wants it. So interesting. Um, uh, the a Society of uh, Mechanical Engineers also had a list of achievements um, the Apollo Space Program, power generation. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Agricultural mechanization. Um, obviously, a huge part of that played here in the Quad Cities with John Deere and Case and all the companies that were here. Um, integrated circuit mass production, um, CAD manufacturing technology. I um, would uh, gather that most of us here use CAD on a daily basis. Bioengineering, codes and standards, another something that we probably all use. Air conditioning, refrigeration, the airplane, and the automobile. Um, and then uh, I just thought I just enjoyed this this advertisement. People used to take out these advertisements every time big projects were completed here in the Quad Cities, and they would just fill the newspapers with all these uh, congratulations on building a sewer plant. I would just watched a presentation on a CSO system, and I would garner that they probably didn't get a bunch of kudos in the newspaper from all the local businesses for uh, accomplishing some sewer pipe installation. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, the National Academy of Engineering, they have this list of 20. Um, and then at the end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about um, what the National Academy of Engineering uh, is looking at for the future. And if you were at the Quad City Engineering and Science Council uh, virtual banquet last night, you also would have heard that same list from their keynote speaker, and uh, it was it just it was interesting. Uh, some of the stuff that that's currently affecting our lives um, and then as well as just some of the stuff here that's had uh, some impact from our region as well. And then if you're just looking for something fun to do on your weekend, since you're stuck at home all the time now, probably uh, th there's this great map where IEEE uh, mechanical engineers and the civil engineers have all taken and put their landmarks together on one website, and you can see um, where they all are around the country. Um, here were some of the ones that were kind of close to where we live here. Um, so the Keokuk Dam, the largest monolithic concrete dam, was um, worked on by many people from the Quad Cities here. I found this great article um, about a guy that uh, had been the lead engineer on it. Um, and then uh, for all of you who... Uh, are really into Quad City history or, or maybe Iowa State people. Um, the Atanasoff Berry computer, allegedly he almost had the idea, drove across the state, was driving over the Mississippi River Bridge and was like, boom, I got it. And he's like, I got to find some place to pull over and stop. And so he pulled into a barn downtown Rock Island and wrote it all down. And that's how the computer was invented. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a great story. Um, <clears throat> so what makes these so important? So some of these are going to be national, international first. Like I said, you know, the first bridge, the first four-lane bridge, things like that. Um, some things are major changes to the face of our community, or they're just significant improvements over the previous system that was here. Um, and so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we define what is this, like, engineering achievement feat. And so as I was looking for all these articles um, where we talked about this stuff, so the first one here on the bottom left, they're claiming ground for these fine levee parks, which... As a Corps of Engineers employee, I know nowadays is considered a 404 violation, and so that it would not be considered an engineering feat now, but at the time, it was a big engineering feat. And if you've ever been to, like, a LeClaire Park concert or something, you probably enjoyed uh, enjoyed the fact that in, you know, whatever year this was, they did this stuff. Um, they put massive steel towers um, over the river and tried to run power from Davenport, well, not tried to, they did run power from Davenport to Rock Island. That was considered an engineering feat at the time. Um, a local engineering, uh, a local company, Walsh Construction, um, went over to the Hudson River in New York, and they did a mammoth engineering feat building a bridge across that river. 
Um, the, uh, in the middle here, you'll see a lady with a couple of TV tubes. Um, their engineering feats streamline the manufacture and cut costs. On the right, there's another woman standing there with this fancy contraption, which is a freezer which drops your food down into it and then cooks it for you and dumps it out. This magic food maker was an engineering marvel. I don't know if I consider that or not. Um, we had several. There was a great um, 50th anniversary of Engineering Week, and they had a few other little articles here that I really enjoyed, too. So without engineers, you've had a bad day. And he goes on to describe all these different things that engineers do in the community that, that help make the community a better place. Um, we talk here up on top. Engineers try to shed geeky guy image. And I really like how they started this one. Engineers do cool stuff. Really, they do. I just like, yeah, I kind of feel that. So remember, you're out there, you're doing cool stuff. Um, we've got the, uh, the Springfield Armory here within our Quad City region. And so, again, maybe not like the big civil engineering thing, but um, a lot of accomplishments there in terms of weaponry and stuff and the mechanical engineering kind of stuff. Uh, and then the, the Quad City Times had this list of 40 different things of like major achievements of the Quad Cities. And so they weren't all engineering feats, but um, you can see here several of them did have some sort of kind of engineering tint to it. The, the train bridge, WOC, which we talked about, Lock 15, the Centennial Bridge, having the largest arsenal in the United States, a bridge that spins around 360 degrees, a big levee wall, uh, the, the first water slide ever developed for Watchtower Amusement Park. And then this was one of my favorite ones in the bottom left corner. This was from like a, a recipe article. And so the Kit Kats were a real engineering feat of uniformly straight layers set in a ball after they made these Hershey bites and they crushed them all up and put them back together. Again, very complicated uh, what is or what isn't that. Um, bottom left corner, some guy named Nick built... Uh, an ice skating rink on the shores of the Mississippi River. It was an engineering marvel. Um, after Cary Grant died, there was a lot of angry people here in the community. And so uh, writing back to People Magazine, who had uh, written up some uh, apparently mean thing about our city and called it an unglamorous bird, um, he recommended we build a giant wall around it, and that would cons constitute an engineering marvel. Um, Henry Farnham, um, who helped build that uh, railroad bridge across the Mississippi River the first time, that was considered an engineering marvel. Um, and then a, a local electronics company had come up with an engineering feat, incredible engineering feat, never attempted in the history of electronic design. Again, pretty exciting stuff. Here's a range, Econo Speed Burner. An engineering feat worthy of the name Great. The 1959 Plymouth, an engineering marvel. A big drainage, 23-mile ditch was an engineering feat. And the Pullman bus that was coming to be shown here was an engineering marvel as well. So wide range, wide range of things. The, the CD, um, we had, a, we had a, a John Deere employee who built a Star Trek model, which was considered an engineering feat. Um, this one is actually pretty cool, the Ryan's Round Barn. Um, over by Kiwani. Um, most round barns are actually not true circles. However, this one is. Um, so this one actually was considered an engineering feat. The Hennepin Canal was considered an engineering feat. Um, and then uh, the, here's a reference to the, the wing dams of uh, being engineering marvels. And, and a hand-operated submarine um, from uh, the Revolutionary War also being of that. So, so anyway, a little bit on some of the crazy stuff, engineering marvels and history that's happened over time here. So I'm going to go through each decade a little bit. Um, and I'll try to tell you about some of the things that I thought were pretty interesting. So the 1920s is all about roads, radios, and skyscrapers. And I know you're thinking we don't have any skyscrapers here, but at the time we did. Um, we just don't consider them that anymore. So in 1920, Iowa had a whopping 25 miles of pavement. By 1930, it had 2,317.2 miles per the uh, state historic map uh, database. Uh, what was pretty like interesting to me, and you can see these are the 1923 maps I've got shown on my screen here. There weren't inner city connections until 1922 and 1923. So the Quad Cities connected to DeWitt in Princeton, Illinois in over those years. Um, and 
it was a pretty exciting thing at the time. So it might not seem super exciting right now, but but it was a big debate. Um, I really loved this this headline too. Problems of the ancients surpassed in pavements for Scott County roads. I don't know if Ken Beck's still on here, but like, I don't know if like when he's voting on stuff as like the county board chair, man, does he think that he's like surpassing the problems of the ancients? I just thought that was like such a statement to make. Um, and here's so where they're discussing. Um, they want to build this national road across the country. And so there was a big debate between these locations about roughly where U.S. 6 is today, where U.S. 30 is today, and where U.S. 34 is today. Um, obviously, they ended up deciding to go with the U.S. 30 route as the Lincoln Highway, but um, we it, it could have been here had we uh, maybe pitched it a little bit better. So, um, so again, 100 years ago, we couldn't drive on the highway from one town to another on pavement. It didn't, didn't happen. I mean, there was pavement in cities and stuff. Um, but it just, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't a thing you could do yet. And so you can see here some of the, the interesting, you know, pavement contracts that were awarded. It was big news. Um, they excavated on route seven between Princeton and here, 90,000 cubic yards on one hill. And they were doing over 13,000 cubic yards a day, which I don't know if that sounds like a ton now, but I feel like on all those old steam shovels and everything, pretty challenging things. So um, and then the Roaring Twenties also brought a building boom to the Quad Cities. So uh, I think these are some of the most iconic buildings that we have here in our region. Um, and some of them, um, at the, so at the time, the Call Building, Capitol Theater, was the tallest building. Parker Building went up, the U.S. Bank Building, um, the Union Arcade, 501 West 4th Street. And then our current tallest building went up in 1927, um, which was the National Bank slash uh, it's now the Wells Fargo Tower. Um in Rock Island, they got Fort Armstrong, which was, again, one of their taller buildings. Moline got the LeClaire Apartments and the Chase Building in the 20s as well. So, again, a ton of things that um, happened over there. So, the Call Skyscraper, as they were calling it at the time, was 10 stories tall. And it still is 10 stories tall. They could actually build it taller. Got a thing about that, too. Um, but it was the tallest building in the Quad Cities in 1920. And it was such a big deal that they brought Louis Amorosi in to do this mural on it, who was, according to a, a historical application he, for another historic building in Boston, um, an eminent Italian mural painter, an ex-official painter to the Vatican. So the Pope and some dudes in Davenport were getting the same guy to paint their murals for him, which is like, I don't know, just like a pretty amazing thing when you think about like that. Um and then here we got the chief engineer of the call building. Now, I don't think that would be the chief engineer necessarily as we would think it, but um, he was managing the day-to-day -day stuff. So the American Theater was in this location back in 1919. July 26th, they move everybody out. By the 7th of October, the foundation work is complete. It's 170 feet by 170 feet. Um, they excavated over 200,000 cubic yards, which was the largest excavation done in Davenport at the time. So I don't know who's keeping track of this stuff about who digs what and where they put it and stuff, but somebody knew that, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then this was the first pile-founded structure that was built um, around here. So they used 1,500 northern spruce logs, 25 to 30 feet deep in length, to go down in there. So if you think, like, a lot of our stuff here... Because we had those rapids, um, we've got a lot of rock foundation and stuff. And so a lot of things are founded on that bedrock here. So this was, uh, it was a kind of a unique thing here. Um, even when the steel showed up on the trains, um, that was a big news story. Um, and then this was the, one of the first kind of fireproof, uh, major fireproof things that they um, started on in this one. So uh, big, big talk about, you know, how beautiful it is, the bronze, the marble, um, fancy boiler room. Um, we could add four more stories at some point in the future. And the cooling plant is the finest in the whole state of Iowa. So really fancy, big, new, brand new kind of stuff going on here. And I don't know, but people loved these elevators. So there were story after story after story about these elevators, how they went to the moon, how they almost went around the earth. Um, they could go 600 feet per minute, which was double the speed of that of any other building here locally. And so um, people were, they were, they were pushing that as like, well, if you have your business up on the top floor here, you know, you people can come and go much faster. Um, and over 1.8 million people, um, came in and out of those, uh, elevators in that first year, which is pretty amazing. So, um, another building here in the twenties, and I won't go quite as into detail of all these, but, um, so there's the old bank that, that was a fire. And then you can see the new one, which is the U S bank building now. Um, again, a very fancy thing for the time. 
the view from up on top there, looking out over the city and all the highlights of all the fancy, again, just, just high tech stuff that they did. Um, and so here in 1927, we get our, we get our new tallest building in the quad cities, um, which still stands to this day is the tallest, tallest facility or tallest building here in town. Um, and it was, uh, the, the article on the left is from the 1950s when they were finally kind of fixing it up for the first time. Uh, and then the one on the right, um, about the emblem contest, this building became the symbol of the community for the 100th anniversary. So it was a really important thing. Um, and then just some other interesting things that happened around in the 1920s as well. So, uh, in 22, they wanted to replace the Sylvan Slough Bridge without interrupting any of the train traffic. We're the headquarters of the Rock Island Lions here, and we got a lot of trains going in now. We don't want to slow things down. And I thought this was pretty interesting because we could probably all go see this still. In 1923, the longest girder in the world, 114 feet long and 97 tons, was installed to make that span without stopping traffic. And they even had this lady christen it. So... I don't know the last time that on any of my projects that we've christened a girder. So I thought that was a pretty exciting thing for an engineer to do. Um, we also here in the quad cities jacked a 60 inch pipe through a levee embankment, which had made, made the news here too. So um, just kind of some interesting stuff. Um, our Riverside power plant goes up in 1925, 35,000 horsepower. That's about 26 megawatts. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about some additional power plants and then just look at the 1100 cars of material all the different things that they brought in for this uh this giant power plant and the largest machine ever installed was brought in on that it took three car loads to get here with five more coming pretty uh pretty massive exciting stuff so the 1930s we've got our depression going on the new deal comes around um and we start doing a little bit of different stuff here so Here's a picture of our first four-lane road in the Quad Cities. You've probably driven on it. You've probably felt a little narrowly and uncomfortable on it as well. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting, too. Mercer County built their first concrete road in 1931, so almost a decade after we connected, you know, city to city here in the, in the main metro, um, the county actually built their first road. So there were some paved roads in Mercer County before 1931, but this was the first one that the county itself had ever built. Uh, and then ASCE came out with this story talking about these big four-lane highways and about how they're bigger and faster and more dangerous. So that was kind of interesting. Um, here's some more interesting stuff. Um, I thought one of the interesting, maybe more interesting thing parts about this um, they're talking is they're finally starting to have this conversation about connecting Chicago and Moline about by by concrete road. And so as they're doing that, um, they talked about tollways. And then, of course, they decided that 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 was just nonsense and Illinois would never put tolls in. So obviously they didn't didn't do that ever. Um, and and then uh, uh, Davenport, easy to reach by over 12 paved roads. Pretty exciting. The, the spokes kind of coming out of that uh, that hub there. Uh, so then, Lock, Locks and Dam 15, uh, this is this is kind of my big big 1930s thing. Um, obviously, it was just such a such a huge uh, project, uh, considered an engineering marvel all over the place, still the world's largest um, of this thing, and and giant power dams, not this one, but you know, just around the world were the were the 1932 um, engineering achievement as as was listed in, in some of these newspapers as well. So here you can see some pictures of um, different things, how they how they constructed it, the, the the real positive view it had for the Quad Cities and and building the community back up after the depression had started, getting people back to work, um, how it might be a uh, sort of a tourist attraction as well. Um, the I guess what was kind of really interesting to me was was this one on the far right here that I've got highlighted just the quantities of material, um, hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of fill and excavation, millions of board feet of timber, over 100,000 yards of concrete, 2.8 million pounds of structural steel, 10 million pounds of reinforcing rods, even just 63 and a half thousand pounds of bolts. Just bolts. Like that's a, just such a incredibly huge quantity of that stuff. Um, later there's a, a slide in here about, uh, 
the 74 bridge and it's got 5.5 or uh, uh, 5,500 tons of structural steel. So just as a comparison with what we have here for the, for the roller dam as well, kind of interesting. So here we are finally finished. They can look at it. Beautiful Lake Davenport in the background there. Uh, a 25 years later, there was a whole bunch of newspaper articles celebrating that 25th anniversary. Um, we're going to make make this a mecca for visitors here because of this engineering marvel. So just a really, really exciting project. Um, other stuff that was going on, I thought this, this one was really interesting. For those of you who are in, in my department or, or do similar stuff to what I do, this was like a really neat article from the 30s about what basically amounts to a watershed study and including all the different backgrounds of engineers and biologists and chemists and geologists and get, just getting everybody together to talk about how we could do this better. And so I, I just thought that was so interesting because that is so much what we do nowadays. Um, the Weather Bureau starts adding better equipment here in the Quad Cities so that we can better start understanding and learning about the weather too. Um, new sewer projects going in on the West End, going over to Duck Creek, doing things like that. Um, big, huge tugboats coming through down the river in our area. And then I had never heard about this one. And this was one of the most interesting things I learned about during this whole research project was Bobo's Folly. And so in the 1920s, this man named Reuben Bobo, Fractor, decided that he was going to um, come up with this plan to build this giant smokestack and put a turbine at the top of it, and it was going to make power through perpetual motion because hot air rises. And already by the 1930s, it was kind of this point of regret. It was falling into disrepair. Um, but this is the second tallest structure in the Quad Cities at this point. Now. So this is just like a few inches shorter than the uh, the Wells Fargo Bank Tower downtown Davenport at this point. So this is a mega structure here in the region. You can see it from everywhere. Um, but it didn't work. This guy convinced all sorts of people to give him money and try to build this thing. Um, but I, again, I had never heard about this, so that was kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, moving on, 1940s. Um, so we start moving into the aluminum, airwaves, and automobiles. Um, so our first uh, our first tower is going up for WHBF TV as TV moves into our region. Um, you can see here the guys talking about how they're boring into deep, solid rock to get the anchors for it. It's going to be 400-something feet tall. It's, it's going to be the new tallest structure, although not a, necessarily a building. Um, and, uh, and we're going to start being able to, to um, spread, spread television throughout our region. Um, Alcoa picks the Quad Cities, which is going to build what is, the, what is now, what, what was and, and still is the largest aluminum rolling mill in the world. A um, bunch of uh, interesting kind of pictures and layouts of what other plants of theirs look like and what they think this one will look like. Um, and so from, from concept to construction here in the 1940s, they, they got that whole um, $30 million plant constructed um, over, over that period of time. So again, pretty uh, pretty exciting um, addition to our, our community. Um, there had been a, a, a advertisement earlier for a great sewer project that the city of Rock Island did. And so there was some discussion on, on one of those sewer projects and how they were putting all the different colors on the pipes, which again is like standard practice or whatever now I feel like, but um, kind of kind of interesting how excited they were. The Andalusia Road pavement was half finished. So you could almost get to Andalusia here in the 1930s. And then, or the 1940s, excuse me. Um, and then and then the Centennial Bridge. Now the, the project did start in the 1930s, um, but it didn't actually open and finish until 1940. So I'm going to take liberty and throw this one in 1940s because I think it's so. Uh, uh, worth moving here into that, but uh, just constant discussions about this um, from people and how how much interest there was in this. They had a parade about it. The mayor they they tied the spans together on the mayor's birthday to like have a big celebration about that. I mean, it was just this was a huge deal. It's got its own little you know like toll booth visitor center thing, um, which again you can still go to and, and see today. Um, the tolls were coming in you know, better than they expected, um, which was a great thing. Uh, 
we got two point almost two point five million vehicles to cross during the first year. What they're thinking, um, and five tolls per minute will pay for the whole thing. So um, it's going to eliminate traffic congestion. Um, I thought this was it was just about the slickest job I ever worked on. Said one of the construction uh, superintendents. So it was a apparently a nice and easy bridge to build. Um, a beautiful one. It was the first four lane bridge to cross the Mississippi River. Um, lots of talks about the lights and the pylons and, and just about all this stuff that uh, that made it. Well, there's a lot of Art Deco stuff along with it as well, not just the, the bridge itself. Um, and then, you know, here apparently we could be driving six lanes on it. We have only typically drive four, but we think it's a real missed opportunity here in the Quad Cities, especially when the uh, government bridge is closed or spinning around for a barge or something. So um, some pretty exciting stuff there. But they... Uh, they had a whole nice write-up here about the engineer. Um, so Ber Bergendorf, um, he he was the lead engineer on it. He said it was going to be one of the, or it was one of the notable bridges in the world at the time. Also, at this time, we had the four of the five main types of bridge design. Um, per per his assistant engineer, wrote an article to the newspaper about this. Um, and so again, it, it's the only four-lane bridge. It's one of the few major bridges in the, in this time period that was built without federal aid. So this was all done privately financed. Um, it's a tide arch bridge construction, which was at the time not typically found. I'm, I am not a bridge expert. You can go to the structural engineering track if you'd like more bridge expert comments, but um, I don't know if that is or isn't uh, the, the most common type now or what, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't think it is. Um, and then uh, the sodium vapor lights there referenced again. And then it actually came in a half million dollars under budget, which is nice, uh, too. And then I, I thought this was interesting. Man-sized rivets were used in the steel. So pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So the 1950s, um, we start going to uh, having some taller towers, wider roads, and, and we, we're making some of the biggest hunks of metal here in the Quad Cities. So we've got a new bridge added between Bendorf and Moline. You can see there, um, I, I referenced 55, I guess 5,250 tons of steel there. Um, uh, Deer broke $500 million in sales for the first time. The Quad Cities is the largest producer of nickel alloy in the world at the time. Um, Illinois' tallest structure goes up in Orion. It's a replacement for the WHBF tower. Uh, and the largest piece of stainless steel ever produced to, to that date um, rolled out of the arsenal for the um, breeder reactor in Idaho at the National Laboratory up there. Uh, so here we are. We can see the guys shoving the cables in there, building the I-74 bridge. Not, not unlike, you know, like we're, we've got our I-74 bridge construction going on right now. Um, here's a, a, a later article about that bridge going up and, and how, how long people talked about the bridge before it actually happened, if anybody could believe that. Uh, this I really just I really enjoyed this one. So this lady worked in down in downtown and got sick of people having to wait for the bridge all the time when it would open up to let barges through, and uh, complained to her boss. And that was apparently how they uh, uh, got the movement going to uh, get get the, get another set of bridges built here in the Quad Cities originally. So, but that was kind of interesting. Here you can see some of the construction um, as they start to build this the span of progress, as they called it. Um, unfortunately, opposite of the uh, Centennial Bridge, this one went up by $2 million as opposed to down by a half a million. Um, a nice article, or a nice uh, advertisement here again, Majeski and Masters put in a nice, uh, nice advertisement in the paper congratulating them on that. Again, I said it was a, a record year for, for John Deere. There's some references to that. Um, the Alter um, and different alloy firms were the ones that were making those uh, those. Uh, uh, advancements in in being the leader in nickel alloy production here throughout the throughout the world um alcoa continues to build and add on to their facilities um and then here we get into the to the new thousand foot tower going up uh out in orion which is uh at the time the tallest building in illinois um which which again is kind of interesting to see and so again all the stuff keeps just adding and adding and adding the Quad Cities is now producing $600 million of products that they're shipping out. And so some of the stuff that's going on here, you know, for example, here we've got, you know, traffic lights at the Eagle Signal Company are being produced. The Univent, which you've probably all seen in every school and hospital and hotel kind of thing that you've been, 
that was actually invented here um, in, in the Quad Cities. Um, Davenport and Bettendorf, they start uh, talking about expanding Kimberly Road because it's starting to grow up in that direction. Um, there was a kind of a fun picture where there weren't any houses around it yet, but they were going to add it. Here's the uh, Corps of Engineers talking about how they're going to start um, adding a bunch of levee districts and reservoirs um, down in the Hannibal and, and Hunt Lima uh, areas, which I, I've been uh, talking about far too much here lately with the 2019 flood and, and damages we've seen across the region. Um, again, more stuff about um, different routes getting constructed across the region here. Um, Davenport turns down a seawall opportunity. Um, that's been, a, I guess, a kind of a recurring uh, Quad City theme over the years. Um, and we're starting to spend millions of dollars on streets on an annual basis by now here as we get to the 1950s. And so here is this kind of, I, I think, my 1950s thing that I think is really cool um, and a major achievement here. So this is the largest hunk of stainless steel that had ever been produced at the time. And so it was made at Rock Island Arsenal, and then it was actually shipped to another arsenal and then shipped back again. Um, back and forth to do different chunks of the work based on the different equipment and, and tools that they had available to them. But this um, helped get the nuclear reactor testing station up and running in Idaho um, for some of the, the major advancements that they did in nuclear power. And so um, this is really something here that we in our region contributed significantly to, to, the, um, to the plan forward. And, and speaking of atomic stuff, uh, Bobo came back. Now, this time they think that they can use it possibly as a bomb shelter because, of course, in the 1950s, a lot of concerns about the Cold War and things like that. So very interesting uh, layout uh, uh, or an idea again. What can we do with this giant tower down here on the west end of Davenport? So 1960s come along. Um, the, the growth rate declined a little bit, um, although, I mean, it's still growing, but just not growing quite as fast. Um, and so this is when we finally get our interstate system really kind of starts to assemble here in the Quad Cities. And so um, there was discussion at first as to is it going to go across the Centennial Bridge or the 74 Bridge? Well, obviously not. I call it the 74 Bridge, the, the Veterans Memorial Bridge at the time. Um, and so obviously it ended up where it is today, as you're um, well aware. Um, here you can see kind of that first layout of what those proposals look like for Scott County there. Um, and then I just, I just had to throw this in here. I just love this advertisement for cement. Like how exciting is cement like in this advertisement? I just, I don't know, like just never felt that excited about cement, but I do now. So, um, and then, and then I 80, as it gets constructed, it's a big deal here in the region as they go and put a new bridge in across the Mississippi river. Um, Apparently, like this was th this uh, this article kind of here in the upper upper middle is um, from from a, a later date. Um, but as they were talking, uh, they had a guy presenting on I eighty. Apparently, the Big X was a very controversial part of the entire system from sea to shining sea. So kind of interesting there. So here you can see um, shoving the I eighty bridge into place. Uh, obviously, we, you know we we all learned about these cantilevers here over the past decade as we saw a bunch of reconstruction out there. Um, and beefing those up. Um, here you can see over the winter, um, they got the piers assembled there, but they hadn't really put much of the bridge on yet. Another another piece here where they're getting ready to slide things into place. So um, pretty exciting thing. Other interstate links, they're happening all over here in the late 50s and then kind of early 1960s. And so um, a lot of that stuff, again, municipal works continue growing, the arsenal's growing. I mean, everybody's growing in the 1960s. And then we also get this fun thing, which, of course, we all like know and love the Montgomery and now Coney Tower, um, where we, well, and I guess it's not even that anymore. It's like a church or something owns it, I think, now. But um, we always love our Christmas tree up on top of that as we're driving across the river. So um, here's a, if you've never seen what the inside of it looked like, I thought that was kind of interesting. So the 1970s. We finally get another new tower in our region, um, and we start to get nuclear power here as well. So this is, um, and then of course uh, Davenport starting to consider one-way roads. The Hennepin Canal is going from more of an infrastructure feature to more formally a recreation feature. Um, and so uh, as we enter this nuclear era, 
Um, in the late 60s, all the approvals kind of happened here for, for the nuclear power plant up at Cordova to go through. Um, and then in it, it, was, it wasn't until 1973 that it actually fully got um, allowed to be turned on. But there was a lot of a lot of interesting engineering that went into behind, went into it in addition to just like the, the nuclear engineering that that uh, I, I am very much a Homer Simpson here in my uh, understanding of, of nuclear. Uh, but uh, the, the flume room here, as you know, again, as a civil engineer, we my section every once in a while, we get an invitation to go out with a biologist and dig around for mussels down downstream of, of where the nuclear power plant um, cooling stuff dumps out to make sure that it's not having any. Uh, impacts on the river in terms of heating the waterway and stuff like that uh and it was it was pretty controversial at the time i guess um again you know before my time but uh um, nuclear power is um you know i guess not universally loved or anything uh even though it is uh, carbon free uh and and i think this is just kind of just for some perspective so the plant was built for designed for 18 19 megawatts um and that giant biggest thing that had ever been brought into Davenport back there in the 1920s, um, that was 26.1 megawatts. And so like only 1.4% of the capacity of this, uh, this new facility here. So it's just incredible over a hundred years, how much even just our ability to generate power has changed. So, um, this was, uh, so this was our new tower that we got in the 1970s, the Northwest bank tower. Um, Pretty exciting development, I suppose, here at the time. And I'm just going to throw this out here for any of you that are working on the I-74 bridge. I am really looking forward to my free full color $17 value 8x10 family portrait with the I-74 bridge when we have the grand opening ceremony for that. So I just, I'm just, again, throwing it out there, looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Um, this was a $2 million tower. Um, Starting from the 1970s on, apparently we just kind of stopped writing about engineering in the newspaper. Um, and so hopefully you've all learned about, you know, some of the more recent engineering things um, through your daily daily business uh, of being an engineer. Um, ah, and Bobo's back. 1970s, we got an energy crisis. Maybe we could get this thing to turn back on and power Davenport. It didn't happen. But I thought it was interesting. So the 80s, obviously kind of tough times here in the Quad Cities. Um, there was not a, hardly anything I could find about engineering in the 1980s, but we did have a couple of stories about um, our organizations here. And so obviously many of you know SK Nanda, I found that in there. Um, some other stuff, um, awards that were being passed out for the engineers in the region. And of course, this is the end of Bobo's Folly. So in the 1980s, uh, they finally did, did blow this thing up and, and tore it down. And so you can't go get your picture taken with this anymore. And see if you can get it up and running. But at the same time, somebody in Germany apparently did get a similar thing called a solar chimney um, to be uh, uh, constructed and, and operational. So maybe it wasn't total thought. I don't know. The 1990s, um, we got our brand new um, Tower of Enthusiasm. I never heard it called that, but... Um, the Mid-American Tower went up in downtown Davenport. Again, another kind of big, new, significant change on our skyline here um, in the 1990s. Um, we also got the, the MARC, or perhaps the iWireless Center, or perhaps the Tax Slayer Center, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, not again, not a ton of interesting uh, engineering right up here that I could find about it. But it was, uh, it was built to be up uh, above the 1965 flood, being as close as it is to the river and as far as I know, for all the floods I've seen since I've moved here to the Quad Cities, I don't I don't think I've ever seen too much water up around it. So um, in the 2000s, uh, lots of stuff um, with our water treatment systems across the region, um, winning awards for upgrading these systems and improving them um, and, and getting more of these uh, bad guys and identifying more of these bad guys in the water and getting it cleared out. So um, pretty stuff, pretty exciting stuff there. Um, and then, of course, our last decade, I think so much of it's been, uh, even at our conference here, been consumed by the I-74 bridge construction and that kind of approach to getting that built. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, you can hopefully you all got to see that presentation uh, in the in the structural engineering track this morning. Um, there was some interesting stuff about um, this renovation of the first federal savings and loan building. 
um, which was one of the kind of historic structures built pre previously. And, and again, some, some kind of a discussion on, on the engineering qualities behind that. So, so my, my top 10 here, um, as I'm starting to run out of time here, um, I think the 1920s, the call building um, was a pretty, pretty monumental change. It was a, a, the biggest building in town at the time and considered our first skyscraper. The 1930s, the Locks and, Locks and Dam at 15, obviously kicking that program off, being the world's largest roller dam still to date, pretty amazing. Um, since the 1980s was a little slow, I'm going to throw the Veterans Memorial Bridge in here too because I think uh, I think it's a pretty pretty monumental feat as well, um, getting that getting that uh, new bridge across the, the Mississippi River. Uh, the Centennial Bridge in the 1940s being the first four-lane bridge to cross the uh, river. The Breeder Reactor Cover in the 1950s being a significant thing for uh, the helping develop nuclear power as well as um, just being physically the largest piece of stainless steel ever created. Uh, 1960s, the interstate highway system, not necessarily you know specific to us, but obviously it does have a huge impact on our region. The 1970s, we brought our Cordova nuclear reactors um, brought online. Uh, 1990s, we got our Mid-American Tower, the regional water upgrades uh, in the 2000s, and then our 74 bridge. And I, I do want to throw out here an honorable mention so if you've ever ridden in a car, truck, or plane, John Ryan of LeClaire, who did not do any of this stuff when he was a quad citizen, um, but he invented the seat belt and the black box and has the patents for those. Um, but so a lot of interesting history about him, too, out there that you can find. Um, there's some stuff in LeClaire. Um, he actually donated the museum there that the, the big riverboat sits in. And there's some stuff in there about some of his creations. So, uh, But he was uh, only half as awesome at the time because he lived in the Twin Cities, which is half as nice as the Quad Cities, and uh, he was a U of M professor up there. Uh, so I guess I want to share kind of in closing here, um, please tell our story. As time went on, the stories about engineering feats and marvels and achievements have dropped off dramatically here locally. And so some of those old articles were written by those engineers that were working on those projects, and some were written by the newspaper, but I think we need to do a better job of telling our story because we haven't stopped innovating and I just think our story isn't getting shared as widely as it, as it once was. And um, even the basic stories about day-to-day, -day, you know, in and out tasks um, that communities are doing, you know, the, the civil works programs for even just your town. Well, again, they might not be like, you know, game changing the world or anything. They're really important for people here locally. And, and they do, uh, they do matter an awful lot. Um, and so when was the last time that you saw a congrats on your achievement full page ad for some project that you completed? Because I certainly can't remember one. And I'll tell you what, like I've, I've gotten to build some pretty cool stuff over the past, uh, past 13 years at the core. And, and so I think, uh, I think there's a real missed opportunity there for us to get our story out. Um, so what's next? Um, the national Academy of engineering has these grand challenges for the future of engineering. So, um, making solar energy economical, and my roof tells us that we're almost there. Um, providing energy from fusion, developing carbon sequestration methods, obviously a, a big discussion here um, as we talk about how we're going to survive through climate change. Um, managing the nitrogen cycle, Iowa, I'm looking at you. I hear lots of stuff about your nitrogen um, going all over the country um, when I go to other conferences. Um, providing access to clean water. and. And if that doesn't play into that whole nitrogen cycle thing too, um, restoring and improving urban infrastructure. Obviously, we is, um, have a huge uh, ability to impact that. Um, advancing health, informatics, engineering better medicines. Boy, have we talked about that the past year here with trying to come up with a, a vaccine for COVID. Um, reverse engineering the brain, preventing nuclear terror. Very you know laudable goals here. Securing cyberspace, enhancing virtual reality. We lost our cool virtual reality store in downtown Davenport because of the flood and the pandemic. I'm so bummed out. Um, advancing personalized learning, um, which as a new home kindergarten teacher this year, I've learned all sorts about that. Um, and then engineering the tools of scientific discovery for the future. So obviously there's things that we all can do to, to help build on on this bench. So. Never forget, as a quad, quad City engineer, you are the best thing since sliced bread. Mr. Otto Rowetter and his bread slicing invention there from the 1920s in Davenport. So with that, you guys can all debate what you think uh, the top 10 should be. And uh, I don't know if I can really answer too many questions about this stuff because I didn't build any of it. But I hope you thought this was at least interesting about the, the last 100 years. Thanks.
Well done, Anthony. So I think we have, we're on a break now for the next 10 minutes and we'll look forward to coming back here and getting another great talk.